So first order is the eight crimes bill. Do you have the uh... By the way, there were two incidents this weekend in Bethany. Yeah, I heard about that. What, what was the second about? Mm -hmm. I heard the one about the dance, the place where the dance. Thing. Yeah, there was another one at the rec center. It just oh, spray painted yeah. white power, and I don't, you know, <clears throat> on, on two separate occasions. And they're dumb enough to leave footprints in the snow, so maybe they'll catch you. They're in your maybe, maybe not. But it, Which draft are we looking at? Um, print we're looking at the as introduced the folders. folders. As introduced. Yep. <laughs> Because the first version you looked at was um, prior to introduction, so the introduced version incorporates the changes that there's, were talked about. There's one that says VBA, VBA. Right, so I'm, I'm immediately at a disadvantage. I don't know. Okay, so I don't want to. read it. So that's, that was submitted Oh, it says 3.1. That was submitted oh, by some of the stakeholders. So okay. the as introduced version should have incorporated um, okay. much of what was talked Thank about. My as introduced is right on top. I think. I don't know why this is. It, I just put them on top of this. This has a couple times in, right in this committee, which I'm not That's familiar it. with. So, so it seems like stakeholders can produce things that look like I, committee's bills. How do they do that? I don't know how they do. You'll have to ask them. <laughs> I think that they, um, oftentimes when you're working with stakeholders, we'll circulate a draft and they will submit their own um, suggested changes right in the I prepare a draft for you, not for them. But I mean, do you take their suggested changes? Only if the committee directs me to. I see. Yeah. Okay. So what is this called? Racial bias? Yeah, 132. Yeah. Yeah. But I put the... S-132. Yeah. And what we did was we went over the bill. Mm -hmm. Because the bill was late getting introduced, we decided to work from the draft version, yeah. change the draft version, and the, and the bill is introduced as yeah. what we've worked on. And I'm going to ask right now if there are any changes to this or if you want to bring the walk through it to remind us what was in this bill. Or, I mean, the bill is originally uh, a product of the Attorney General's idea to try to put together a database that would give us information. I might add, I had a number of, over the weekend, a number of calls about S-119. I thought you were taking up government operations. It's S120. It's not S119. Oh. It's S120 and what's the name? No, of that? we are not taking. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say that. What's the name of that one? It is um, what it does is it well, I believe it's 120 because I've gotten it on both. It, remember last year we passed the um, a pan, created a panel and then they um, they're going to uh, a, look at systemic racism in the state and then they're going to hire a director i mean they're going to they, okay. to work with the governor and and what s120 does is wants us to promote from a change the term from an executive director to a commissioner because they'll have more power which i don't i'm no, working I with the, i'm talking about a different bill well s119 is an act related to law enforcement training and appropriate use of force de-escalation tactics so I got oh, oh, that's oh, they're they're mixing yeah. them all up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just, I, anyway, one thirty-two. Okay. Let's stick with one thirty-two. Yeah. I shouldn't have brought that up. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so um, would it be helpful if I had talked about this draft as yeah, the first one, the first one you looked at? Okay. Right. So good morning, Bryn Hare, the Legislative Council, for the record. Um, so section one has no changes from the last from the draft version that you looked at. This is the section that gives the attorney general that civil investigative authority to mm -hmm. investigate hate crimes. So there are no changes made to that section. Um, section two, this is the working group, the creation of that bias incident working group, and there are some, lots of changes in this section. This is where the committee focused a lot of discussion um, mm -hmm. when it last took up this bill. So um, it. This formative language here says that the working group is created to analyze how to appropriately intake, respond to, and report on bias incidents consistently among all law enforcement agencies. And the goal of the group is to do these three things that are listed on page two. From each point of contact with law enforcement, victims or communities impacted by bias incidents receive appropriate law enforcement response. 
ensure that standardized data is collected regarding bias incidents and when appropriate reported to the Attorney General or other appropriate law enforcement and to ensure that individual rights are protected by the Constitution or laws of Vermont and the Constitution or laws of the United States are not violated. The membership of the group was changed to add the Vermont State Police, the Vermont Police Association, the Vermont Sheriff's Association, and the Defender General's Office. Didn't the Defender General decline? <coughs> What's that? I don't recall. What did you say? Didn't the Defender General decline? Mm. No, I think they didn't want him. The other people didn't want him on there. That's right. The other people didn't want him. Right. So we did have the sheriffs and the police. Anyway, the duties. Okay. So. We've added some new language here that tasks the working group with um, consulting with the Human Rights Commission, the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity in Schools, the Vermont Interfaith Action, and the Vermont branches of the NAACP and ACLU, and any other entities or individuals the working group deems appropriate. Mm -hmm. And in consulting with those groups, the working group should define bias incident for law enforcement purposes, Identify or develop best practices to, for law enforcement response to bias incidents, including referrals, and establish a method to standardize the system of reporting to the Attorney General and other appropriate law enforcement, including establishing codes for bias incidents and ensuring that accurate data is collected and tracked. And the last um, duty on page, last two duties on page four, is to identify or develop law enforcement training on bias incident response, reporting and coding, and then reporting to the General Assembly, um, specifically the uh, Justice Oversight Committee and the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council by July of 2020. So we've bumped out that due date for the report. And then lastly, there's some language in subsection D there, that none of the recommendations or actions of the working group shall interfere with any individual rights protected by the Constitution. And that was language that was specifically requested by the stakeholders. <coughs> so I'll move on to section three. This is the minimum training standard. Before we do that, I'm just wondering what, what is that speaking to? What's the... Well, since that was language that was requested by them specifically, I might direct your question to them. I think that, they're, that they are concerned about um, infringement on First Amendment rights, mm -hmm. and so they wanted to make it clear up front that that was not the goal of the working group to. But I would leave that to them. They probably have a better answer than I It's Well, the reason I ask is because none of the recommendations makes one kind of sense, but none of the actions of the bias and the reporting group is I'm not sure what actions the group could take that would contradict some of those. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Um, but you're directing the question. But well, I, I, I would say it gets to question. the heart of the matter, though. That if you post something on Facebook that's clearly racist but has no threat to it, does somebody have a uh, better example? Somebody says that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was racist. That's actually a congresswoman said that the other day. That's, you know, might consider, you know, who knows how that's going to take. I get that. But that's, so she has a right to say that. But if you vandalize and break a window at a theater in Bennington be, and write white power because you're upset that they're hosting a group from Africa to do uh, some kind of singing. It's a touring group. <coughs> no, I'm not. That, which are, which? That's not my, that's my that's question. Not question. Okay. I think the action is the collection, the actual collection of the data. The, I, they, they, but that's the, a recommendation, that, that they're recommending the collection well, of data. No, because their goal is to ensure that their standardized data is collected. 
No, so, but, the, but the, work, the reporting working group won't be collecting data. They'll be recommending the collection of data. Okay, well, we can find out from the so my, they, what action my, means there. Yeah, my question is, why doesn't it say just the recommendation? What, it, what, it, what actions could they take that would interfere with somebody's individual rights? Collecting the data, collecting I guess. The, but they're not collecting, collecting the data. No, they are, that is their goal. They're going to recommend the definition They're, they're recommending it. that data be collected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think they're recommending mm -hmm. that data that is protected speech not be collected. That's, I think that's what. Right, that but, says. but you're going to impanel a group, then they're going to make recommendations. But this is additionally saying they can't take any actions. Suppose somebody says, you didn't interview me, that contravenes my constitutional rights. Is that included under actions? One of their jobs is to analyze. So I would guess that if they attempted to analyze by interviewing somebody and interfered with their constitutional rights, that would be an action mm -hmm. as opposed to a recommendation. I just think this is a really um, loosey-goosey piece of language myself. I mean, not in that it's, its purpose is clearly to protect people constitutional rights, but if you're on this working group, there's a piece of language that says your actions may... I thought that's what, I'm, again, I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but I thought that the goal here was to not collect that kind of thing, that you're not being the thought police, but you are looking at racially motivated incidents, and they're going to help to define that, but when they're defining that, you should keep in mind that there's constitutional protection to free speech. I think Philip wants, doesn't think that this group is going to take any actions. I think they are taking actions by developing the uh, standards and by defining the, mm -hmm. the, the definition of bias incident. They are take, those are actions. Those aren't well, just recommendations. Those are in my opinion, maybe those I, are actions. Maybe the attorney general would like yeah. to weigh in whose representative okay. is here. But you know, I thought what we were looking for was an incident like the one that happened in the, the ones that happened in Bennington, which were vandalism, but because they wrote the words white power appear to be racist incidents. Both were vandalism versus a statement on Facebook, no matter how objectionable that statement might be. Am I missing something here, Mr. Attorney General David? No, I think what you and uh, Senator White are saying is accurate in terms of what they're trying to protect against. There are actions that are being taken mm -hmm. in accordance with subsection C. And as those actions and recommendations are being developed, be mindful that there won't be any imposition mm -hmm. on constitutional rights or rights established by the state law. And that's, I think, all that that is trying to say. There was a statement on Facebook, alleged statement on Facebook, but unfortunately it was wiped and they couldn't find it during the Attorney General's investigation regarding Kaya Morris. Mm -hmm. And that statement related to, if you don't get her black, so, so forth, out of town, I will. That was a threatening behavior that could rise to the level. That, but unfortunately, um, somebody deleted it, and it, evidently during the Attorney General's investigation, they couldn't find that particular statement that allegedly was made. So that was considered to be threatening language versus language that says, you know, how can you represent, how can a black woman, there was vile language, but how can a black woman represent white people in a white town? No, and I, I, I agree with that. <clears throat> I'm focused on the words or actions, which I, I think brings, brings up two sure. fields of action. One it's is- It's not your actions. He's it's, it's mm -hmm. the working group itself. Different. It's focusing on their, yeah. their actions and how they're conducting their meeting, how right. they're interviewing witnesses. Yeah. And I, I feel like that, uh, I, it's, 
I can see saying that they're recommendations, um, but, it, but it seems like an odd spotlight to put on this group that the statute says they can't contravene somebody's rights in their actions as a working group. I understand where you're going, and I'd like to ask David a question. Yeah. David, with subsection C, the Human Rights Commission, for instance, is being consulted by this working group. If the Human Rights Commission was told by the working group to release files that are normally held as confidential, is that the kind of action you're trying to prevent happening here? I think that's a good example of something where it's a state a protection established by state law. Right. And in making such a recommendation, that would be an action that the working group has taken that would contravene a privacy right established by state law, and they therefore couldn't do that. I right. think that's a fair example. Um, another example might be when it says to develop best practices right. for law enforcement response to bias incidents. It's possible you could imagine a best practice being developed that does uh, impinge on constitutional rights to free speech. And that, again, would be an action that would contravene constitutional rights and wouldn't be acceptable in accordance with this legislation. Where I see Philip struggling, and I understand why he brought up the question, the difference between the recommendation and an action, to me at least, charged to analyze certain things and then say you're directed to consult with entities might tend to lead some to believe they have a power that they shouldn't be granted to access certain things that would normally contravene constitutional rights. That's where I'm seeing the word action come into play, because that's not a recommendation. And, and I, I just I find myself thinking, could this group be stymied at various points by people saying, the way your board is acting contravenes my constitutional rights, mm -hmm. and they get, they get all tied up? I mean, these are things that we assume anyway, that they're going to act constitutionally and that the recommendations will pass constitutional muster, but I think when we explicitly put it in here and we include actions, it's sort of putting it out there as a tool for people to use against the working group, um, which, I mean, on, on the, from whatever perspective, they might want to do that. So I, I don't know. It's probably fine. It just leaps out at me as um, maybe productive of unintended <clears throat> well, the, the rest of us. May I ask one more question? Yep. Different, different topic. I mean, but um, we use anti-bias training and it, it, instead of implicit bias training. Is that the term that's generally used? Is anti-bias training? Okay, that's existing. One, that's in the existing one of, statute. Yeah. One of the notes that I wrote down when we were discussing this business not turning law enforcement into the thought police. Mm -hmm. and I, I, that's where uh, I, I think that's reflected in those things. So can we go to number three? Sure. So the changes to the minimum training standards language um, include that there if you look at the bottom of page four there's some there's some new language that provides that um, on or before december 31st of this year law enforcement shall receive hate crime training as required by the subsection and two years later law enforcement have to receive the bias incident training as required by the subsection um, and then you see that there's some new language in subdivision three that in order to remain certified, law enforcement shall re either receive a refresher course or demonstrate proficiency in the training standards established by the council on the training required by the subsection. I think that was um, a proposal that you heard discussed at the last meeting. And then the last section, section four, the attorney general's report, um, nothing about that section has changed. That requires the attorney general to report to the standing committees on um, statistics about hate crimes. <coughs> did, did all those dates work that, out? Pardon? I was just wondering, in section three, did all those dates work out? So, mm -hmm. so, so this was a proposal from the stakeholder group that they agreed on. So it just provides that on, on or before this last year, 
Uh, law enforcement has to receive anti-bias training, which I think they're already receiving. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Why do we have that in there? <laughs> well, is that still in there? On or before 12, 2018, they shall receive? Yes. Yep. So that's anti-bias training. Yes. Yeah. So it just removes the um, that requirement that they receive a minimum of four hours of that training. That's what the change to yeah. that sentence. Yeah. Says. Why don't we just leave that whole sentence out since they supposedly already did it all? Well, I think that because it's an ongoing requirement. Yeah. This is a this is a okay. ongoing well, requirement for sure annual training. See that it's right. And so then it just yeah. it bumps out the the date that they have to receive hate crime training to the end of this year. And then two years later, they have to receive the training on bias incidents. So that presumably gives the working group time to come up with the training. And does that, does that I guess we'll hear from them whether it actually gives them the time to do the de identify and develop the training. Because first you have to identify what bias incident is. If you're asking a specific person or both of them. Whoever, so I was asked, this asked is a I'll ask direct through recommendation from the stakeholder group, so I'm assuming that it gives them enough time that I will okay. answer specifically. That would fall probably on the, on the academy to come up with this, so, and that's already, we've already got an outline of what we're going with. This, it, Even before you define bias incident? Yeah, we're, it's pretty much, we're, we've been working on this for over a year. Okay, okay, I just want to make sure that we're not setting you up for failure. I'm going to just say the report, in order to get it read by somebody, does it automatically go to the Legislative Council? Do, they, I mean, do you get these reports? We get them through, through Justice Oversight, we get them, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So could you add the Justice Oversight Committee? Yeah, are you talking about the Attorney General's report? Yeah. So that the Justice Oversight Committee is receiving a report as well as Yeah, we get them through if they come to the standing committees. So it's on that. So I don't need to put that in. We don't need to put no. that in. Okay. No. Sometimes we get report we get so many reports. This was the question. Senator White introduced a bill of reports on reports that see <laughs> why the claim. Yes. Um, but really reports on reports. And you know, they, they automatically sunset after five years now. Well, I'm not able to read all the reports that we get, but I would like to About read this one. So I <laughs> probably shouldn't request it tonight. You shouldn't. That's why they automatically it's sunset fun. now. After someone's five done years. all that work, which is Yeah, but a lot one of the reports that you keep asking about is the governor's budget report. And I think we should probably keep having the governor submit a budget. Yeah. I don't think that should sunset. I don't, <laughs> I don't think that one will. <laughs> but it's always on your list of reports. I know, because they're always on there. <clears throat> All right. Any comments from the audience about this bill? So, Bryn, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion in committee about this? Um, can, could I just ask Joe one question about the uh, B on the top of page two? Did you have some concerns about that, about that being too far reaching? B on the top of page two. Mm -hmm. I remember there was some discussion of it, of, about <clears throat> giving powers that might be the camera. I didn't write down any notes about I do know that the ACLU had some, it was, they felt it was too broad of an authority. Um, and I thought you had a couple of concerns also. That maybe that was not me. Okay. I don't have any notes on it. I remember we did have some discussion about that. Mm -hmm. Well, now we got the ACLU. They could take a deposition, I wrote down here. Let's see. They give subpoena power with this. They give subpoena power with this and mm -hmm. can take a deposition. Preponderance of evidence in a civil case. This part is questionable per Joe. <laughs> uh oh. Mail to the wall. Well, I think that, well, the, 
if I'm reading their, their uh, letter of February 14th correctly, yep. <clears throat> while such broad authority may be reasonable in the arena of unfair commercial acts, we find the grant of similar authority when it comes to possible private, mm -hmm. constitutionally protected speech or other hate motivated discriminatory conduct prom problematic. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, yeah. you're correct that they did have a concern about the broad authority. And, and I thought Joe did also. Did Joe did too. This is what I said. This um, <laughs> part is questionable for Joe, and I always quote. Well, I, but I do think that the section we just talked about regarding the constitutional protection. That's the reporting. That, no, the right. other one is the gives the AG authority to. Yeah. Had yeah, that other provision is just it's separate. Right. Julio had a comment as well. What did Julio say? He could. Well, I can tell you what he said. What I wrote down. He said he could probably tell you about what he said. I said, um, if a person does want to, doesn't want to comply, we would need to get it for us. <clears throat> he didn't want to comply. <laughs> No, she's asking Carrie. Are you asking yeah, Carrie? Carrie? I'm sorry. I was asking you. No. Oh, that's right. I was asking you. Mm -hmm. I don't think too much about yeah, tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I'm sorry. You I just, right. I just want to make sure that, because there was that question about it. Um, yeah. so I think the eight. I've got a bunch of comments. It is a kind of interesting transfer of authority from commerce to mm -hmm. hate crimes. Thank you. Same as in the consumer protection statute. It is, in the, and, the, and their suggestion was that it may be okay in consumer protection, but you're protecting speech here, not simply. So the other so we need to keep this information obtained confidential unless you get a court order. Can you ask for a copy of 9 VSA 2460? 2460? <clears throat> yeah, that's the provision that's cited. That's the consumer protection. <clears throat> and I believe it gives them... <clears throat> I'm a little concerned because I'm having a complete blank on having this discussion. Get it older. Do you have the ACLU letter? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. But... According to the statute, this is their letter, whenever the AGO has reason to believe any person to be in violation of consumer protection law, they may examine or cause to be examined in books, records, papers, memoranda, and physical objects bearing on the alleged violations. And while such broad authority may be reasonable in the arena of unfair commercial acts, we find a grant of similar authority when it comes to possible private constitutional protected speech or other hate motivated or discriminatory conduct problematic. And then in a criminal context, a warrant would be required. But here, you're just giving them the authority to um, get it hmm, okay. without a warrant. Well, I, I would. Hmm. Chloe White's in the room. Uh, I don't need Chloe White. I need Julio Thompson. Oh, he's sick. I just talked to Dave. David? Yeah, so. Um, When's Julio going to be better? <laughs> <laughs> I believe, uh, I mean, I don't know. But uh, hopefully, uh, tomorrow at the latest. OK. Can, Come in. Um, I'm going to hold up to work on this bill until we can hear again from Julio on the, the why this is a good idea or a bad idea. <clears throat> Chloe uh, is on her way, but I don't know that I think her letter probably mm -hmm. explains everything that she has concerns mm -hmm. with. Um, but I don't want to hold up the bill. But I do remember Julio talking about this analysis, always taking great notes. If Julio can't talk in person, if he could send us, you know what the issue is. And if he, yeah, I'll, uh, speaking of the devil. I'll be, I'll be <laughs> Hi, Chloe. Hi. Um, if we just um, we're going over your memo regarding the broad authority in. B on the top of page two, the attorney general's blah, 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 your, your letter was pretty, we decided to hold off to, uh, I don't know what we have time. You have it this on again for Thursday. All right, so Thursday, uh, to hear from both you and Julio on this specific section of the bill. And you, you've, uh, we've got your letter. Um, 
for you, but I think we'll hold off to hear from both of you at that time. And if Julio's still sick, he could send us. We'll make sure he can do it by phone or, or whatever. Or he will be ready to do that yeah. Thursday. Okay. I don't want to take it away from you. <clears throat> And I'm happy to speak with the AG's office as well. To and maybe if you and David concerns. can work something yeah. out on this issue, that would be helpful. Of course. I'll do that. 60 Minutes had quite a story about the ACLU this week. That's what I hear. Yeah. I Four million new members. I thought you were on a cruise. You didn't have time to watch Well, I was TV. back for Sunday night. I was back in time to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> It takes them two hours to watch it, but it was <laughs> four, million, four million additional people. But the former executive director said they've overstepped their bounds. They've overstepped their bounds? Yeah. yeah they have too many members? They are candidates. promoting political candidates for the first time. Oh. Oh. But they say they're not. But. Oh. <laughs> you, should, you should go online and take a look at the 60 minute story on the ACL. Nah. Well, thank you for bringing up. Well, Rhode Island and, Rhode Island and some other states have written letters of concern <laughs> to the national <laughs> <laughs> oh Sorry about that, Joe. All right, so we're going to take this up again on Thursday morning. <clears throat> All right, making progress, continuing the progress that we're making. Are you doing, uh, are you the, no, Michelle is the, is Eric available? If Eric or Michelle, I'll take up either 105 or 117 now. Brent, uh, Peggy, can you see if Eric's available to do? Uh, you don't want to do Michelle 117? If she's available, yeah. Yeah, she should be here in the sex so I don't think we did. All right. <coughs> yeah, and it's really the AG 50 school that we want to look at. Or state's attorney. You know, yep. it's a lot of power to put in the universe. Or state's attorney. Yeah. 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 Therapeutic. Huh? Therapeutic. Therapeutic use of marijuana. Oh, Eric's here for the miscellaneous bill. Whatever you like, we could. I don't know if we have all the witnesses for that one or not. I don't think there are any witnesses. Oh, it's me. No, we're just all set. We're all set. We've done our work. We just need to approve the bill. The commissioner was here on this year. This is the miscellaneous, not the good time. Right now, he had an issue in there, the escape work. I think he's good with the language. Oh, okay. Oh, by the way, there was a bank robbery in Manchester, and, and they can't charge him with bank robbery. I think it's terrible. Huh. That we Somebody don't should have do something about that. <laughs> Somebody I should. think the miscellaneous bill should add bank robbery to our theft check. Do you know anybody that can do something like that? I don't. Do you know somebody who can do a lot? Uh, I just felt like four members of my committee didn't want to do bank robbery. I just, I don't, I'm fine with doing a bank robbery bill. No, well, maybe we'll do it after crossover. I'm fine adding it. I've decided. Because no, no. you do go where the money is. Well, Rob's the interesting thing, he was working on the roof of the bank, oh. <laughs> took a break from working on the roof, went in and robbed the bank, came out, went to McDonald's, and did he go back to work? Changed his clothes, and then got caught because he was carrying McDonald's bag, and everybody knew he'd gone to McDonald's. Oh, this was all within an hour of his robbery of the People's Bank in Manchester. Do you, do you think you could... I, I know the gentleman, and he's... Not the brightest of Yes. I guess, Shocking. I guess. Oh my God. Shocking. <laughs> but, I mean, not only did he change his clothes at McDonald's, but he threw them in the McDonald's container where the police were able to identify the clothes that he'd thrown into the container. <clears throat> and then he had a large amount of cash, which the bank will not disclose the amount of cash because they don't want to say how much cash they were taken for. The police didn't want to say how much cash, but got a lot of amount, large amount of cash. But the fact is, he was working on the bank roof. That's crazy. Unbelievable. 
So speaking of banks and cannabis, which is about to come right. up, uh, our savings and loan in Brattleboro is so, all set to take on cannabis. Um, which bill do you want to do? They're meeting with the FDIC this week. Eric, and they I'm uh, going to so, you, Eric got here first. Oh, okay. Can you wait? Do you want to go first? Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, I would just say that for the, there's some of the people who are part of the discussion for a 17. I can wait, but yeah, I just, I know there's other people. I see there's people here, but. We, we can do this quickly, I think. Okay. Should I go away or come back? Or stay? Stay right here, stay please. Here. Uh, 105, what's left that's controversial? Uh, there are a couple of things. There's at least one thing. Um, this is a, uh, the issue of the ability of the court to refer defendant to diversion without the consent of the state attorney. Oh, yeah. Good. So that's the outstanding issue that uh, I think the committee heard testimony, uh, taking different positions on this. You'll see that it's for both juvenile and adult diversion in the bill. It's on page two is the um, juvenile di diversion piece, page it's the exact same language with respect to adult court diversion. You see it does exactly what I just said that it does. Right now, uh, the consent of the state's attorney is required in order for a case to go to diversion, except for that. Um, uh, actually, that's in, uh, Yeah, section. So in this case, uh, it changes the existing law by allowing the court to refer the case to diversion without the state's attorney's consent. If it finds after a hearing, so you see on line three, page two, there has to be a hearing, if the referral's in the interest of justice and the case is otherwise held. So it's a policy decision for the committee. I think yeah. there's uh, testimony that the committee's heard on both sides on this, so it's, you could certainly hear more from witnesses about it. Uh, or, um. Yeah, let's hear from Judge Gerson and if he wants. I mean, what do you have to add? I, I don't have anything to add to what I previously testified yeah. to. I have one minor amendment to the bill when you get around to it. Okay. And, but and, uh, beyond that, talk. John Campbell or Mr. Pepper, either one, welcome to, to give your opinion of the state's attorneys. John Campbell, Executive Director, State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for a lot of it. Thanks for the comments. Um, again, I, I, uh, you were not here when we had, when we were here to testify before, and as Eric pointed out, this is certainly a policy decision. But. <laughs> so much I remember these days. Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to fix. No, no, I know. I'm yeah. trying to fix the bank robbery statute. Okay. <laughs> well, we had a bank robbery in Manchester. I know. Our our state's attorney was intelligent enough to find a crime to charge the person with, because so we have no law against bank robbery. We tried it. We tried to change it. I don't think somebody decided. I did. I got a lot of opposition on the county. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Let's go back at it. Anyway. Why you're in favor of this or against it? Well, uh, it's just really two reasons. Number one, I, I think it's um, clearly the, in search of a problem. That I don't know. I have not heard any factual evidence that that uh, problem exists. But fundamentally, the biggest problem with this, I, I really do believe, I've done uh, significant research on this, is the separation of power issue. Um, this is a, um, a matter that uh, when you give it a, a uh, refer something to diversion, or even deferred sentences. This is prior to the adjudication. Uh, this is basically a time where the, uh, the state says, uh, we're gonna offer you something to say time out. We're gonna give you an opportunity if you complete the program or if you do what you're supposed to do, um, then the charges will not be um, uh, brought against the, uh, the individual. Uh, right now, you're having the court uh, in the judiciary branch come in and pretty much assert not pretty much, but it would be serving the um, uh, obligations and duties of the uh, of the state's attorneys, and I think this is clearly separations of power issue between not only just in the federal but also the state our state constitution. 
So that's one part, um, one that I think is extremely important. But the second is that um, if this is all about reversion or about alternative justice, I, I think it's clear what we have done in the last three years based on where this committee and the, and the committee and the other body has gone and said, you know, we want to see more alternative justice. And we're in double digits. And in fact, the uh, records, the, the data that was released in the report from Willa uh, Farrell, um, it doesn't even take into consideration those cases that are not eligible, that are not eligible for uh, diversion, but also um, there are a lot of a lot of our counties have pre-charge programs where that won't even, won't even show up in that. So we are. I think that the state attorneys have done a great job, and um, I feel that the uh, that there's really no need for uh, the court to now come in and say that they want to be able to um, overrule the state's decision. And again, I, I really have to point out that it's the executive branch's function to go ahead and to bring and to prosecute um, uh, crimes in the state. Uh, and it's the judiciary's then responsibility after there's conviction to determine uh, the sentencing. So that's what I'd like to bring again to the, to the table here. I would tend to agree with the state's attorney's position in this particular case. I, um, I think, as I remember it now, last time, I, um, I don't see any issue <coughs> with having the courts be able to do it after a hearing, but we just, um, we've seen an uptick in the use of diversion now, so <coughs> I wonder why we would do this right now, and let's wait and see if more states' attorneys, and if they, if they begin to use it, more and more, it looks like it's I, on an upswing, and, would, and then look at it next year if we need I, to. I would agree to that, but I also think if we put some attention into conditions of release, um, I'm awaiting the bail bill from the House. I, I have some ideas there, and I think that's a place where we could actually have more of an impact. So, so I just had, um, you know, there was discussion of, um, you know, some state's attorneys not doing it and a judge feeling, well, they should have in this case, but the fact is there are, just like there are conservative state's attorneys, there are conservative judges, so I think, I, I, I think it should just stay with the state's attorney's office. Okay. Three votes. I think, I know where the committee is going, but I just want to make this observation. The state's attorneys have the power to bring a charge. But I've always looked at deferred sentences and diversion as falling into the category of disposition of a case. And in this particular language, if there's a hearing, that assumes that you have brought the charge. There is disposition now pending, and the courts <coughs> have the power under this language to decide it should be disposed of, and I think that falls within their prerogatives, not the state's attorney's office. I tend to agree, however, with what I'm hearing here, that until we see a glaring problem, it may not yet be time to take that step. But I think for future purposes, mm -hmm. I would have to disagree with you on where we're going mm -hmm. with that separation of powers argument, because that is disposition of the case that has been filed, especially if there's a hearing that, that, that assumes that both sides have been lined up for their respective arguments. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a wise man who once told me, I think it was the guy who sits at the end of the table there, is that when you won, shut up. <laughs> when you lost, shut up. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to say which one I'm here, but I, I think it's uh, there was a president of the that one time when you just told me shut up. Shut <laughs> 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 I neglected to take his advice. <laughs> I can't believe Shaman told you to shut up. Yeah, I know, wasn't it? <laughs> but I, I would love one day that we sit there and, and discuss it because it is a it is a, a, a good. I, I think it's the sense of the committee that we take out. Um, be it top page two and the other reference of page four, I believe it is. 
both were B's, so yes. they got both B's. Right. And I'll just say on behalf of Safe Service that we will continue our, um, well, well, I think our we'll, we'll continue. I, again, I'm looking at the mail bill is much more. Um, at some point, we need to have somebody. And I think it's one of the things that came out of our meeting in, in New York City was the idea that we're one of the few states that doesn't have anyone supervising people on conditions of release. And it's time to look at that because I think then you're more comfortable in having people released when there's someone supervising them. You know, like this bank robber. You know, I mean, think, think about it for a minute. You're working on the roof, rather obvious. You're walking in there with clothes. You see, you're working movies. on the roof. You rob the bank, allegedly. You go to McDonald's to have breakfast. Are you, I guess I'm unclear, who would supervise him in that instance? Um, uh, in some states it's probation, in other states it could be the sheriff's department. I think other states have varied the variety, but I think it's more common to have probation and parole supervised. Mm -hmm. Depends on the state. I mean, we would have to examine the different states and how they do it and what would work for them. I think one of the reasons that judges frequently are really reluctant to release somebody on bail is who's, who's you know, on conditions, is who's supervising the conditions. Now, there is a danger there. You, you'd have people um, who are, you know, reported for violating a condition mm -hmm. of not drinking or something like that. But on the other hand, <coughs> well, it's called a condition for a person. It's usually somebody who is related to or living with yeah. an individual who is responsible to do it. But I think if you're going to transfer that to probation, it mm -hmm. might have a corresponding impact on the need for more probation. Well, I'm sorry. And probably yeah. more prison time for people violating. If you, but the, well, that's a very good segue into the next issue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As, as, which is the section on page seven. Mm -hmm. um, it's all highlighted. And um, I think we're not going to get to uh, the bill on uh, marijuana this morning. So I'm sorry to all the people who are here. It doesn't look, it looks like this escape language is going to take a little longer. So I apologize to all of us. Maybe it won't. You might want to hang in there, but it may not get to it. So we are confused. We've been trying to work on um, this guy that robbed the bank. is so typical. He was on furlough, by the way. Was he really? Yeah. Oh, my. You know, I know his mom and dad. I know them very well. I, I played golf with a guy who scrambles and stuff, too. So I know. I, know. I mean, was it the sort of thing where he wanted to be jailed? I think so. I, you know, just to, Has he got a place to live right now? Or he he's 37 years old. He's an irresponsible person. He's he hungry. Up. Clearly, carrying McDonald's food is probably the cause to be stopped. So I'm curious to know how that exists. Well, happened. because the guy who was he was working was said uh, he went over to McDonald's for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> when he, so he was outside of the bounds of his furlough. No, he was working on the roof Jesus. at the bank. You gotta read the whole story. Yes, sir. It the McDonald's, sounds, the, sounds interesting. It sounds you're carrying like a McDonald's bag and you, I, you know, you're identified as the person who was working on the roof, mm -hmm. but you've changed your clothes. <laughs> Did the bank know they had furlough prisoners on the roof? roof? I don't know. I can't answer that. Yeah. That'd be an interesting decision. <laughs> I don't know. But since she Commissioner Touchette is not here, Eric is going to explain the problem of escape while on furlough. Well, as you mentioned, Senator Sears, that's a great segue into the, into the furlough slash escape issue. The issue here is that evidently there have been some folks who were on furlough who have been uh, not actually escaping from DOC custody, but have been simply return, failing to return from furlough, which is specifically provided for in the statute. So the difference between escape, failing to return from furlough, uh, but uh, they've been charged with five-year felonies for this, and I think this was 
part of the discussion that the committee had about reducing the number of uh, persons in the incarcerated population is this is uh, a way to go about hopefully accomplishing some of that reduction. So I went over this language with the commissioner. I think that uh, the state's attorney's got to see it as well, although I'll let John testify to that himself. But I, I think that the, it was circulated. And so it's narrowed down substantially from the language that you first yep. uh, looked at. So the way it's crafted now, and the new stuff is really over on the top of page nine. And as I mentioned, there, there are separate charges under the kidnap, or sorry, the escape statute between escaping from a correctional facility and just failing to return from either a furlough or a correctional facility uh, while you're on some types of furlough status. What this proposed language does, it says, well, it's not going to be a violation of one of those charges. It's not a violation of the failure to return from furlough charge. If you, if you were on furlough status pursuant to one of these itemized, and you see line five, page nine, mm -hmm. those are the particular types of furlough that it would not be a violation. They are reintegration. Uh, the first one, 808A6, is reintegration uh, furlough. The second one is medical furlough. The third one is community reentry furlough. The fourth one is treatment furlough. The fifth one is home confinement furlough. And the last one is another type of uh, reintegration furlough. So though, if you're on furlough under any one of those statutory furlough provisions, then it's uh, not a crime under the escape statute for you to fail to return from furlough. That's the effect of that language. However, the, the, they still don't want to be able to bring the person back in, right, if you don't return. And that's the language you see in the, in the new section lines 9 through 16, absconding from furlough. It allows the commissioner to issue a warrant for the arrest of the person who's absconded from furlough status in violation of one of the types of furlough that I just mentioned. So, But it's not a new crime. Correct. It's not a new crime. They can bring them back in. Uh, they don't get charged again. And they don't have to do it. I'll be, uh, this is a discretionary, not required. I thought that the person who I thought what we were designing here was a bill to accommodate someone who is at um, one of the treatment programs, like um, the one in Rutland or mm -hmm. Wallingford, um, this one sells, for example. <coughs> Those off the reservation, uh, you know, they're required to stay within certain bounds. Right. I know one guy who went to hit, to a car that was parked in the showed up across the street or in the driveway. That's all he did. Um, he may have been getting drugs. He may have been doing whatever he might have been doing. But he was thrown out and then charged with escape. Right. And that was what I thought we were trying to avoid here. Mm -hmm. I thought. But on the other hand, if a, if a guy is on furlough and, you know, takes off and decides to go to North Carolina, that that would still be an escape. And I'm hearing that that would not be any longer. No, no, I think no, that's exactly what would happen. That's exactly right. So, yeah. so okay. it gives the commissioner discretion? That's only for the person who goes to North Carolina and escapes can still be charged under with escape under the existing, under on page 7, 1501A. They can okay. be charged with escape. But it's, it's but, given him the, it's given the commissioner the power to decide whether it's an escape or no, just a, no. The escape is a totally separate thing. That's a okay. totally separate charge that so we handled. A, a, he could charge him with escape, but he doesn't. He have doesn't it. charge. The SA does, but, but he the, could refer that to the, the SA. SA could still charge for escape. Exactly. For the guy that went to North Carolina, right. but the guy that just went off the off the dismiss house property would would still be able to be charged. No, no. Nope. If you look at line five, page nine. Nope. Uh, that, I think, the situation you described is probably covered by treatment for 808A, the first, second, third, fourth one there. Well, what if he was, let, let's take the guy from New Hampshire, the guy that went to New Hampshire, the Valley that Valley Vista, committed a new crime. Right. Could he now be charged with escape as well? Yeah, he, he went off to, he went out of state, right? But he yeah. was out of treatment for all. This only is a was defense. This only him? says that it's only... This only is a, a defense to the to the charge under B1, failure to return from furlough. It's not a defense to escape. Okay. So the person can still be charged with escape under subsection A. Okay. So um, so are we are, are we decriminalizing failure to return from furlough under certain 
situations. Yes. Okay, not all furlough, because you see that they, there are yep. some degrees of furlough that are left. But I mean, could could that lead to people saying there's no downside other than losing my good time? Well, they'd still have to go back to prison. Right. Well, but they I mean, just like, don't get a new crime. Right. Well, they don't. They don't actually. If they don't or they don't have to go back to work. If they're gone for 15 days, they they have to serve the 15 days when they get back. That can't count as part of their sentence. So right. I'm reading that. Right. Yeah. They, but they there's don't. no. There's no. Uh, in other words, if they just decided they wanted to disappear for a couple of weeks and stay, right? They come back. There's no real downside because they're just making up the time. Well, that'd be up to the commissioner, I would have. Yeah, I, you might want to ask the commissioner about that. I, can, okay. I, I would suspect that their internal disciplinary proceedings would allow them to. Okay. That's the that's I think was the idea was that they they didn't want to lose their ability to discipline the person internally, but they didn't want the new crime to attach. That's right. I remember that testimony. So. Right. I, yeah. Okay. Are there any comments from anyone in the audience? Judge. For the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. I haven't had a chance to talk with Mike Touchette, so what I'm saying here I, I haven't explored with him, but I was curious in looking at, focusing on uh, page 9, the section absconding from furlough. talks about the commissioner issuing a warrant. Um, that's obviously something new. It does, it's not clear to me in this section what the standard would be. Uh, is it probable cause? Um, the issue of um, on this, it's it's not an offense uh, if the commissioner issues a warrant, a, a regular or standard, if you will, arrest warrant is now um, forwarded to a um, central filing uh, because it's entered into the NCIC system, so the warrant uh, can be uh, issued by anyone and. Uh, uh, it's not clear to me where this warrant would go and who would have the authority. Um, if I can respond to that. So this is just, this is exactly what is an existing statute for failure to return from probation. So you might want to, it's an existing process. The commissioner attracted on that, that language and the commissioner suggested because it's based on that language. So I don't know how that process works, but only, only add that it's not entirely new. Um, so might be something that well, we can Two things we can do here. We can drop the escape language and put it in the miscellaneous bill that's coming over from the House and get this thing out of here. Um, and you all discuss, you and, and uh, Judge Grierson and Mike Touchette, anybody else who wants to discuss the escape language. And we can do it in their miscellaneous bill, right? Sure. And got one. Yeah. But we got two miscellaneous bills running around. Or have you got it? Or, or is this? I, it, it was just, I was just express when I looked at this. Yeah, but it's already current law. Or, I mean. Well, the difference between a violation. I'm getting concerned I'm not going to get any bills out this week. And I don't want to, obviously this is an important bill because it's the, you know, technical amendments or miscellaneous provisions bill. And, and I'm not trying to pull up the bill other than point out. out. But, just a question, if we, if we take that out and we take out B on those two things, what's left? A lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. All the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Penalty when the offense is treason, um, punishment for perjury, guardian, misrep, mis Okay, I see, yeah. Report okay. from the special investigative unit, pretrial risk assessment. Okay. A whole bunch of stuff in here. It's a good bill. Might be the most important bill we do all year. The, my understanding with the uh, schedule for this week is this was coming back later in the week for vote and I can work with Well, them. yeah, I, I hope so. But I, again, if this is becoming too, if the escape thing is becoming too complex, fine. Well, this would be a nice issue to solve mm -hmm. because this is something that happens to people. Yeah, no, no, no question about it. Our goal is yeah. to. Uh, what I just described. Yes. Yeah. On the other hand, I want to make sure we still got the person that yeah. absconds to North Carolina is committed yeah. a crime. Because yeah. 
It might be also helpful if Duchette could let us know how many violations of furlough there are. Of all the, what's the record? If we could get that, if you could ask Mike Duchette to give us that information. Sure. In a year's time, how many people are violated on furlough and how many are charged with escape, how many are charged with uh, new crimes, et cetera? But the only question really here is this absconding about who does the warrant and how that works, right? Well, the no. difference between the, the I thought that was warrant the, that the commissioner issues right. for violation of probation, <coughs> ultimately there's right. a new charge, and therefore there's a review of that. Right. So this that, one, there doesn't appear at this point to be any review of the commissioner's exercise of discretion okay. to issue that warrant and what the effect of that warrant is is my only question. Right. So that's the outstanding question there, that yeah. is around the warrant. And I'm glad to talk with the commissioner to shed. As I said, I, had, I didn't have a chance to talk to him. One, one quick question for the judge, I, I think. Does the commissioner now have the power to issue a warrant? Well, he does in, in a probation of violation. But that would ultimately lead to a new charge of a violation of probation. So there's an element that would be, I see. Um, and this doesn't appear to have a review element uh, for the commissioner's uh, exercise of discretion. Something happened in the discourse here that I thought what we were going to do was establish to a misdemeanor escape charge for that group that went out of bounds that they could be charged with, you know. A, a new misdemeanor, and those uh, they, the person that went to North Carolina could get charged with a, the felony escape, and that's what I thought we were going to do. And something happened there uh, between the commissioner and, and drafting the bill. So that's the other alternative. You could do that approach, certainly. Just you know, change the five-year felony to a misdemeanor. A, a misdemeanor um, crime of, you know, that be discretionary on the part of the state's attorney and what to bring, but. <coughs> and it just, if I can, we don't usually bring these unless the actual DOC had comes to us to say, hey, we want you to bring an escape charge on this thing. That's so, it's not. I mean, it's a and that's why I thought originally they were talking about a policy change within the department, yeah. saying, look, we're going to look for alternative methods. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, if the guy goes next door for a cigarette or smoke marijuana, I mean, let, the, let the department decide what to do with them. Well, that's what this mm -hmm. would do. Yeah, that's what I like. Mm -hmm. I do too. Can I just take, take follow up on something Philip raised? When the violation of probation comes to the court, it's a petition. Does the commissioner already have the power in advance of that petition to issue an arrest warrant? Yes. That's in statute. That's what this is based. That language is huh. the basis of this. I know that. And I believe as John was saying, under a furlough, the, the commissioner can pick up somebody if they violated their, their furlough status. Whether or not they decide to bring a charge, they don't have to go to the state's term with a new escape charge. Right. To, 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 to the I always knew that DOC could actually yeah, pick up somebody who was on furlough, but I didn't know that they had the power to issue a warrant in advance for that. Usually, I thought a warrant was issued by the court. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they make a request to the court, and we. I thought the judge had to. That's why, I'm, uh, yeah, that's where I'm going with that. I, I always thought a warrant was specifically within the prerogative of a judge. I've never heard of the DOC, and maybe the, that is the language, but I've never heard of the DOC actually saying, I'm issuing a warrant for the arrest of so-and-so. They certainly have the power of a person's on furlough because technically they're still under their custody to say, go pick up X. Uh, but the actual issuance of an arrest warrant, that, that just <coughs> sounds odd to me. Are there any other issues in this bill? Yeah, that are currently controversial at this point. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last one, I think. There's some it's not in the bill. There's one amendment yeah, that I oh, yeah. proposing. What's that? And I have copies of it. It's to okay. essentially establish a new crime for violating a declaration. Uh, in other words, under our new case, it's all based on our new case management system. It doesn't lend itself to <laughs> use of notary public. <laughs> I don't want any new crimes. Well, if you, right now, the problem, uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, there are a number of statutes, and I don't have the book and page reference to them, <clears throat> that uh, talk about a declaration uh, under the pains and penalties of perjury. 
and there is currently there is no provision if someone were to um, untruthfully swear, it's not perjury. So this, on one hand, creates that new crime that if you're making an oath under the uh, under a declaration of pains and penalties of perjury, there will be a crime for that. It's important to us because as we move forward with our electronic case management system, um, there will not be a, 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 a means <coughs> of uh, notary public, okay. documents that require notary public. Uh, and this would allow us to proceed with electronic I think it's a great idea. By declaration. We can get Paul Manafort if he did it. This state. We might. Call in or another. I'd hate to have them go free because they didn't have a law against them. Thank you. So we we have been swearing people in, for instance, the auditor was sworn in under pains and penalties of perjury, but there was no actual notary. If there's no notary, if there's a notary public, that's different. Um, that's so where someone appears before okay, a notary so and swears. That that is. Per, that could be perjury. Right. But, but many of our statutes say that you're declaring something under the pains and penalties of perjury without swearing. Every time you order. submit your payroll, yeah. you click yes. on something that you. Mm -hmm. so we I guess there's no crime if you. To put ourselves in jail. <laughs> right. that, well, was, that wasn't the idea. But. <laughs> well, but it's an example of where you're saying that under the burden, you know. <laughs> that you say this is true. And so this would make. Is that an unconscionable clause? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. What about when it says uh, you're not going to be able to do it in support of search warrant application? Because we still want the uh, police to be able to swear. If you're not, talking they're about out, they're out in the car. They're out. Right, I need to give ten minutes to Carrie in Virginia okay. to doing on talk about something. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think this is probably a good idea, um, but we'll get back to it later. I'll be glad to answer. Yeah, no, I think it's a good idea. I didn't realize. I thought we were. I know it was the last minute. The folks uh, were, were going to be rolling out our case manager system this spring, and yeah, they brought it to my attention. They're kind of late in the game. That's my understanding of the game for me. It is just like that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, we're going to add a little thing on bank robbery. Should be against the law. But just add it to the the grand larceny statute, bank robberies. <coughs> Depending upon the amounts. Yeah. So you don't want to add any the way it was in the Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. I just, I just, I just, I just have it consistent with the penalty for I just texted it. Have the penalty consistent with his charges. The grand larceny. Yeah. yeah. Right. Whatever the penalty is. Oh, okay. Oh, so don't make it any different. Penalty same. Penalty same. Except it's a new product. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. So, good morning. So, good morning. So, so, thanks. Michelle Taz, for the record, and I just wanted to have a couple minutes for you guys to, to circle back on the issue of testing in the medical marijuana bill on S-117, yep. um, because we had Terry and Virginia here. And um, you'll recall a, a, a few committee discussions ago with this, and Senator Sears was raising the issue around testing at the dispensaries currently, and we talked about the fact that there's really no, there's nothing in statute or rules requiring testing other than you have a requirement that they, they be properly labeled with regards to the amount of THC and certain things that are on the labeling. Um, but, there's, but there's really not anything there, but the dispensaries do do their own testing. And Senator Sears have raised the issue and said, well, I don't like the idea of them doing their own testing. What can we do? There's language in S-117 with regard to expanding the Ag Lab's authority to be able to be doing testing of not just hemp, but also cannabis. 
And so I've been talking with Carrie as well as Virginia Renfro about capacity for the Ag Lab to be able to do that. But the issue is that because there's so few dispensaries um, and there aren't these, there's not a, independent labs in Vermont that can do that. It's not like there's a lot of places where they could go and do third-party testing, but <coughs> according to Kerry, um, who hopefully will track down here, he says that the Ag Lab does now have the capacity to be doing compliance testing for the dispensary. So I think in talking with him, I was like, well, do we need new language? Do we need to tweak things to try to address your concerns? He thinks that the language that's in S117 does it and that they can be able to do the testing, the compliance testing for the dispensary. So I just wanted to check in with you guys. That way, if that wasn't satisfactory to you, that I could work no, on something. Sounds, that sounds good to me. Yeah, good okay. Sounds good to me. What is yeah. the cost to the state? Well, Virginia is going to answer that question. So, Vir Virginia ran through the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. Uh, in the uh, S17, there's actually language in here that the Department of Public Safety is responsible for that cost because the dispensaries are already paying $25,000 a year to them. And as we've heard over the years, there's actually money that's uh, that they're not using. So um, we yeah, the we, Department of Public Safety. Yeah, the Department of Public Safety has this kind of fund that's set aside. So uh, we've always felt that it would be, you know, again, I think for the dispensaries, they always welcome the testing, and um, you know, our conversations with the Agency of Agriculture. Um, over the last few weeks has definitely been that, that they can uh, they can start testing tomorrow and we're all all the dispensaries are good with that, uh, with that. and so it does have language in here that the Department of Public Safety would be uh, uh, and I think that yeah, Carrie's here now that we can talk about that there has been an MOU de developed has not been signed yet between the agency uh, at, and the Department of Public Safety. And that's in section six if you look at the bill introduced in subsection C. Page 13. Yep. Okay. Uh, everybody's good with Michelle working and carrying and yep. on the language that allows us. It's great. I but think, it's already here. I think they're there. fine with the language. They think oh, the language here. that's in the bill so, takes okay. care. Yeah, right. I, I think the language that you already have in this bill is in, and Carrie's here and he can speak to that, but what we would, you know, the dispensaries are uh, totally supportive of ag if they want to come tomorrow and start testing that, you know, and we don't think that there needs to be anything else in here that states that. But um, I don't know if you want to hear from Carrie. Carrie, sure. Sure. For the record, Carrie's here, you can see that. Um, the language in here mimics what we have for the hemp program. Um, we, well, when you're in Randolph this afternoon, if you look off to your left when you're pulling in, that is our new state ag environmental testing laboratory. Um, we do have uh, on the first floor the entire laboratory carved out in the Canvas Quality Control Program. Right. Um, there will be an economy of scale. We're building um, into the hemp feeds that are moving through this body. Um, a position to certify third-party labs and work on the uh, <coughs> reporting protocol. So, <coughs> testing the products from the dispensaries fits right in with what we're going on. It's not the methods are the same, the instruments are the same. Right. Um, yeah, I've, are we almost ready on this bill? I think you guys have taken testimony, but you haven't sat down and just gone through and right. talked about the issues that people right. raised. You've heard from the Medical Society, you've heard from the dispensaries, right. well, and so I think you probably just need to go The Medical Society through. always supposes one section, so does the House. They just thought about it. But if we didn't put it in, the House would be disappointed. They wouldn't have anything to take out. They wouldn't have I, don't, I don't think there's a big issues. I think it's more just kind of going through the No, I'm talking about the, the, the expansion of I have questions about the amount of three ounces. Okay. Um, so we did have some discussion about that. All right, so later in the week, hopefully, we'll finish this bill. But we did get, so everybody's okay with the testing section. Yep. Great. Thank you for working on that. I remember that. <laughs>